it's our last uh, seminar before Easter. So usually we have this standard seminar in Krakow quarter past two uh, our time, but this year we have it online, which has some disadvantages and advantages because now we can, we can uh, advertise it worldwide. So Markus Glass now is in Gdańsk and he visits us to tell us about his most recent results concerning um, symmetric informationally complete POVMs. So Markus, you have your screen and uh, one hour time. Go ahead. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation and thanks for all of you turning in from UK, from US, from Stockholm and more locally. So I will give you an idea also for those who are not yet familiar with the problem of sick PVMs, what we did over the last 10, 15 years. Clearly it can only be a highlight and I will go quick over some of the slides, but I understand that later you can access the slides so you have a chance to look at them. I also want to mention that in particular, the most recent activities are jointly with Marcus Appleby, Ingmar Bengtsson, who is here, Michael Harrison, who is with the Magma Group in Sydney, Gary McConnell, a number theorist, and Andrew Scott, whom I also welcome here, who did a lot of the numerical part. And for doing numerics, I've benefited a lot by the resources of the Max Planck Institute of the Science of Light in Erlangen and the Max Planck Society for the German Operation Max Planck Gesellschaft in general. And of course, the Institute in Dansk is funded through money from the European Union. So let me just jump to what is a PUVM. And I take a quantum information perspective kind of a quite operational one. For me, that's the model of a measurement device for a single shot experiment. So we have as an input a quantum state. And whenever we input a quantum state, we get one click for each of the inputs. And the possibilities, I just picked as an example, five possible outcomes. And clearly, that's what everyone should know. Quantum mechanics to some extent is probabilistic. So we will see each of the outcomes one to five with some probabilities P1 to P5. If we accept the model that quantum mechanics kind of uh, has a linear model, then we know that the probabilities can be phrased in terms of a linear functional of the input given by the density matrix and some operator pi one to pi five. Clearly, since we're talking about probabilities, we know that all these quantities have to be non-negative. And from that, we can conclude, since we make no restriction on the input state, that all the operators must be symmetric positive definitives, means they don't have negative eigenvalues. Also, we know that clearly the total probability should be one. So the sum of the probabilities is one. That means also when we use the linearity of the trace, that the trace of our input state times the operator should be equal to one for all the inputs. And that gives us the additional condition that the sum of the operators should be identity. So from this kind of simplistic model of a quantum experiment or a measurement device, which just gives one click per output, importing the linearity of quantum mechanics in terms of the probabilities we assign, we get that the operator showing up should be non-negative and the operator should up, sum up to identity. And that's what you would usually find in quantum mechanics textbooks, which are more mathematically oriented. So that's what you find in the textbook. We have M positive semi-definite operators PI that sum to identity. And now when we want to implement that measurement, again on the abstract level, 
what we can do is we use an M-dimensional auxiliary system where M is the number of our outcomes and then perform a projective von Neumann measurement on the auxiliary system. What we need for that is that we start with our input state and the auxiliary system in some initial state, which I just put the label zero on it. We apply a unitary operation on the whole system. And then we perform a measurement on the auxiliary system in its standard basis and get a result I for that outcome. And then the state is transformed with effects AI, which have the property that AI dagger times AI equals our POVM element pi I. But those elements are not unique. So in that sense, the post measurement state we have really depends on the way we are implementing our POV. But on the abstract level, we're just learning some label I of our measurement about our quantum mechanical system. And as I kind of described before, these probabilities are kind of determined just in terms of the operators of the POVM. So this process, which I sketched here, is called the Neumark or Neumark extension. And clearly the number of outcomes of the POVM is independent of the dimension of our Hilbert space. So it can be any dimension and all we need, all in quotations, it's clearly that's the kind of experimentally challenging part when we really want to implement the POVM, how we do this unitary operation. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I want to ask the question, how do we find them? But before going to that, let's go to the name of this SIG POVM. And we first start, what is an informationally complete POVM? In particular, what's minimal and minimal in the sense of cardinality. So assume we have a POVM where we have the number of operators, the number of possible outcomes is D squared. And if we assume that the operators are linearly independent, then clearly we know that the linearly independent operators form a basis for our state space. And therefore any state can be uniquely written as a linear combination with respect to that basis. When we now measure the POVM, then we know we get the probabilities which we had derived before as the trace kind of a kind of extended Born rule of rho times our operator pi. And if you combine the two formulas, we see that the coefficients cj times this overlap in terms of trace in a product between the operator i and j, and that gives us the probabilities pi. So when we want to use that for state tomography, in order to get the coefficients cj of our state, we have to invert the matrix given by the matrix elements, the trace of pi i times pi j. So that clearly can be done for any set of linearly independent operators, but there are some which are more suitable for that type of tomography or this type of reconstruction from the measurement results. And that is where the symmetric informationally complete POVMs, the SIG POVMs come into play. The first assumption we make is that our POVM elements are rank one elements. So they are rescaled versions of some operators. And also we assume that the rescaling is the same. So all the elements get the same weight. And the symmetry in the name that tells us that the overlaps should be a constant. So the constant is beta. And then it's a small exercise using that the operator sum up to identity. We find that this rescaling of the pure state projections is actually one over the dimension. And the coefficient beta for this overlap between the POVM elements is one over d squared times d plus one. 
And from that, we find that in terms of the pure states involved here, the pure states, we assume they are normalized. So if i equals j, we get one on the side. And if they are different, we get one over one plus d. Why is this symmetric in my complete QVM particularly nice for tomography? It turns out that this problem of inverting the linear system is quite simple since each kind of coefficient is just, we have here the probability we are measuring and we are just rescaling it and subtracting one times our POVM element. So we have a particular nice reconstruction formula, which in particular decouples all the measurements. So related to that, we will also have quite some noise tolerance. So that's a brief kind of a quantum information processing motivation why we are looking at sick PUVMs. But the question is, do such POVMs exist at all or not? So the problem we can very simply phrase, the question is, are there d squared vectors in the complex space, which correspond to states, pure states, such that the states are normalized for all of them, and that the mutual overlap modulus squared is one over d plus one. So that's a problem you can phrase to any kind of first year math student, physics student, whoever knows the concept of complex vector spaces and all. There is a connection to frame theory. There, those vectors would be called equilateral tight frames or finite, finite unit norm tight frames. And we can just use this characterization kind of to rephrase the problem and say, okay, we write down each of the vectors in terms of unknowns in order to express this inner product. We actually split our coordinates, which are complex, into the real part A and the imaginary part B. So the I here is the square root of minus one. So each of the vectors has 2D real variables. Since we have these square vectors, what we get in total would be two times D cubed variables. We get D equations of type one, which are all of degree two in the variables. And we get D squared choose two. So quartic in D number of equations, which are also of degree four. So we have a lot of variables, a lot of equations, and we are very quickly lost in trying to solve that. Excuse in order me. To kind of, uh, yep. Shouldn't there be d squared equations of times of type one? Because j is an index coming from one to d squared. Uh, the, yes, you're absolutely right. Kind of, uh, we, we have d squared vectors, so we have d squared uh, equations of type one. Sorry. And thanks for spotting that. And whoever has questions, just interrupt me and ask. Okay, the idea to simplify the problem is to use the Weil-Heisenberg group, also a concept most of you would be familiar with. So it's a group generated by two operators. One operator is just a cyclic shift with respect to the basis vector. So basis vector J goes to basis vector J plus one. And all the operations are with respect modulo d, so the d minus one spaces, or kind of the basis vector d minus one, which is the dth one, goes to basis vector zero. And when we take the diagonal version of this operator, we get just phase vectors where we have primitive free root of d through root of unity here on the diagonal. These operators have nice kind of algebraic properties. They form a basis for matrices. If we ignore the phases, they have nice commutation relations, but we are not looking at that. We're just kind of merely using the group for the moment. So this is the nice basis, yes? So, so this is a nice unitary error basis. One could use different ones, but we restrict ourselves just to this one 
since that one exists in all dimensions. Yeah, no, I'm joking, and it's nice, but we call them nice. It's really a name, nice L basis, yes. That they are nice because they form a group and the basis property is just what we have here, that they are trace orthogonal basis of the space of D by D matrices. What does it mean, this zeta of uh, H? Is it a kind of... Um, uh, uh, okay, in the last equation on this slide, there is a... Uh, so that, that's the center, so it's the center of the group, which is just the diagonal matrices in that case. So I look at the quotient of the group by its center. So we are effectively kind of in more physical terms. We are ignoring all these phase vectors, which could show up. And then we are left just with the matrices X to the A and C to the B. So those are all, and here the set index D, it's a shorthand for the integers modulo D. Mm -hmm. So we get D squared matrices when we just look at x to the a, c to the b, and we ignore all kind of phase factors that uh, might occur when we look at products of matrices. All right. So how does that help? We now just take the ansatz and say, we are picking a fixed initial vector, which also goes by the name of a fiducial vector, that's our state V0, zero, and we apply the operators X to the A, C to the B for all possible exponents A and B. So by that we get kind of in general, if we don't have an eigenvector of any of these operators, then we get in total D squared vectors and we impose the conditions we were looking at. So whenever these exponents are the same, we want to have it normalized. And if you look more closely in that, it follows already that the initial vector is normalized. But when these operators are different, then this overlap should be one over d plus one. And now we can write down our fiducial vector, this initial vector, again with variables x, can I have now combined A and B into two D variables, X zero to X D minus one, which are real variables. We can also say that because we have a phase degree of freedom, that our first coefficient for the basis state zero should be real, so we can remove one of the variables. And with that ansatz, instead of D squared vector, we are looking only for a single vector. So we have now only two times D minus one, since we can use the phase degree of freedom variables. And we still have kind of this D squared plus D squared over two variables, uh, e equations for the variables. And it turns out when we try to solve for that system, we are kind of uh, getting in trouble starting from d equals six. I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, when we want to solve that system, clearly we don't get very far. So we have to try to find further simplifications. And for that kind of, uh, we use a principle in physics, we are trying to impose or utilize more symmetries. So the symmetries we are looking at is, we are looking at operations that in the end commute with our Weil-Heisenberg group. So I've written that in more formal mathematical terms, but when you look at this here, what we want, we look at operators T, such that when we conjugate an element X to the A, C to the B, what we want to get is another element of the Weil-Heisenberg group. So it's an X to the A prime, C to the B prime, and we might also pick up some phase factor. And it turns out that all the possible unitary matrices with that property, when we ignore all the phases, we find that the action just on the exponents is actually just a linear action on this two-dimensional vector space 
over the integer small of d. And what is even more, this two by two matrix T here, which transform the exponent a b into an exponent a prime b prime, that is a matrix that has determinant one. So we will see that a little bit later that we can describe all the additional symmetries just in terms of two by two matrices. There's another symmetry which corresponds to complex conjugation, which is anti-unitary, which is also kind of a time reversal when we fix the basis. And in terms of our matrix X, that was just a shift matrix, which has zeros and ones in them. So they don't change under complex conjugation. But the matrix C that contain a complex root of unity, which goes to its inverse. And that also means that under complex conjugation, the operator C to the B goes to its own inverse, C to the minus B. So in terms of matrices, we have this matrix, diagonal one and minus one. This is clearly not in the special linear group. It has determinant minus one. But we can add this operation to the group of possible symmetries. And why is this all good? That is actually something that goes back to the PhD thesis of Gerhard Zauner back 22 years ago when it was defended. He made the following conjecture that for every dimension D, we have a UVM, which consists of rank one operators E0, corresponding to our fiducial vector, under the Weil Heisenberg group H of D. So the unlocks we have taken was actually motivated by Zauner's conjecture. And Zauner conjectured even more. He said there is an additional element from our symmetry group that commutes with our fiducial. That means it stabilizes it. And this operator has order three. So the additional symmetry of order three, what that means effectively it cuts down our dimension of the space by another factor of three. This is not a general property, but uh, this particular element here has the property that all kind of, it has all three possible eigenvalues, one and kind of a third root of unity and its inverse, and the dimension of the eigenspaces are approximately the same. And where are we with this conjecture to date? So we have numerical solutions for all dimensions up to 193. I have to stress that when Zauner came up with this conjecture, he had solutions only up to dimension seven. So we are quite far now in that. Of course, numerics still could fool us. So we also have algebraic solutions for by now a lot of dimension. You will see more about that. And for those particular kind of the guests who don't know yet, there is a paper which advertises a price problem, five open problems in quantum information. And one of them is Actually, it's asking for slightly less than proving Zauner's conjecture, which asks for every dimension. In quotation, all you have to do is to prove the conjecture for an infinite series of dimensions. That would be good enough to win a prize, which is, I understand right now, 2021 euro yes. might go up. Yes, might go up. But slowly, linear. Depending in which year, kind of, uh, someone is able to solve one of the problems. Okay, let's turn kind of a bit closer to the title of my talk. How do we really search for these POVMs? And that is something that has started with a paper by Joe Reynolds, also co authored by Andrew Scott. Uh, Carlton Cave, and I think it was Robin Gunekut, who was among the quarter level. So there is a quantity which comes from frame theory, 
And this quantity kind of calculates an overlap between the coefficients, kind of it is a form of degree four, takes the square and then sums over all the indices. So when you look at this, it's a triple sum. So we have d cubed terms. And it turns out that this quantity is lower bounded by two over d plus one. And moreover, when we reach this lower bound, then we have found a fiducial vector for a while Heisenberg T Pumian. So all one has to do is to find a global minimum of this function. So one approach kind of quite canonical is we're looking at this function, we take a gradient descent and start minimizing this function, but the condition kind of, uh, I wrote in the top of that, we have to have a state. So implicit in this formula is that we have to normalize since otherwise clearly by rescaling our vector, making it smaller and smaller, we could go beyond, kind of below that lower bound. So we have to do minimization subject to unit norm. What you might have learned in school or in your calculus classes is would be Lagrange multipliers for that. But also something I learned from Andrew Scott in that context is a very neat trick. Actually, instead of looking at this function, what we are doing is we take an arbitrary vector and we normalize this vector. So we, instead of evaluating kind of this function only at unit norm vectors, we're just plugging in an arbitrary vector and we normalize it. Also what we have learned from Zauner's conjecture is that restricting the search to our subspace might be a good idea also to reduce the dimension. And we can also include that if we denote by P a projection to so an orthogonal projection onto a subspace, then we can kind of uh, capture all that in a function capital F of X, where we input an arbitrary vector X, first we project it onto the subspace, then we renormalize it, and then we evaluate the original function. And then it's kind of a tedious, but not so complicated exercise in calculus. You apply the chain rule to this function and you find that the gradient of this function is kind of a nicely related to the gradient of this original function. The original function, what I pointed out before, has a complexity of dimension cubed many terms to be evaluated. So when you have to take the gradient of this function, again in D dimensional, actually in real 2D dimensional space, you would expect another factor of D entering the picture. But it turns out when you store intermediate values, effectively what you see here, so you store these squared intermediate values, and then you can also calculate the gradient using the chain rule with overall complexity d cubed. d cubed is effectively kind of a, the, the complexity when you do matrix multiplication, when you solve linear systems. If you don't use advanced techniques, but at the same time, of course, when you go to dimension 193, then 193 cubed is already very big. Sorry for that. So what Andrew Scott did was he has a very efficient implementation of all that for the C++ program, which later then I took using kind of a parallelization with uh, programming technique for those who are familiar with it, using OpenMP or CUDA for graphical processing units. 
Also what Enwu found is that he did a lot of experiments with different optimization methods and this limited memory broadened Fletcher Gold for channel, short BFGS algorithm, performs quite well. But nonetheless, we are facing the problem that most of the time the search will hit a local minimum. And we have no clue so far what a good initial point would be. So all one can do is we pick a random initial point and run the search many, many times. That's where the high performance computing clusters from the Max Planck Society and another IT provider to the Max Planck Society, GWDG, came into play where I ran a lot of these searches. And just to give you an idea, kind of for the records I had shown, for dimension 189, it took about 23.3 million trials, initial points, which amounted to about 3.5 CPU years, just to find a single solution. For dimension 190, this went up by a factor of three, essentially both in terms of trials and CPU years. For dimension 193, it didn't jump that much, but we in the end needed still 13 CPU years. And we are going for almost 80 million trials. Marcus, so, may I ask, may I ask a question? Yep. Has, so you, you point out that the searches run into local minima uh, quite easily. Has any thought ever been given to whether there might be a better behaved function than the frame potential that uh, would be minimized by a seek, but would be smoother or not smoother, but, but um, contain less local minima? Um, kind of, I tried a little bit for some time with perturbations to the function, omitting certain terms. It's something I'm not discussing today. It turned out to be kind of, I had dimensions. Uh, I did comparison for some dimensions where the function had a better chance kind of uh, to converge converted a bit earlier, a bit faster, even in cases where the original function went into local minima, but I also had uh, cases where it's just the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I didn't come up with anything conclusive. I'm also quite optimistic that with all the activities in machine learning, they are minimizing kind of highly nonlinear functions in high dimensional spaces is one of the major tasks that there should be something maybe also replacing the minimization algorithm or something that would make use of the local minima to determine what is a good initial point. But it's something kind of where we currently hit the wall and uh, I would be very happy if someone had ideas or would even just would do some trials kind of uh, that. But we, the, the short answer is we don't have any good alternative at the moment. Okay, thank you. Also what I want to point out, kind of I was very ambitious for reasons that will become a bit late, uh, clearer later to go for dimension 5,779. 5, That's why I used the GPU since clearly D cubed going for a four digit number is tremendous. So in 18 GPU years now, which was much higher than kind of uh, what we used in CPU years here, I only managed to get something like 55,000 trials with no success. Of course, it doesn't mean anything kind of a uh, you could be lucky, and that's what I want to point out or illustrate you briefly here now is, we have here just on the horizontal axle that I mentioned, and here we have a logarithmic plot scale, kind of the number of iterations we needed to get a solution. And 
I averaged over 100 successful trials. And what you see here is effectively the straight line here is 1.222 to the power of X. We have an exponential growth in the number of iterations we need in order to find a solution on average. It gets slightly better when we impose the symmetry of Zauner. It seems that our base goes down from 1.22 to 1.00. That's just a rough kind of graphical fit. It's not any kind of a rigorous mathematical fit of the curve, but it's just, we see, we go up to something like 95 in the dimensions and to iterate up to 100 solutions. The growth is slower, but still exponential. So there's not too much hope. That's the average number of iterations we are looking at. So let's take a closer look. What is the minimal, the average, and the maximum number of iterations we need? When we look up to 70, we see now even just in linear scale for the number of iterations, the minimal number of iterations is close to zero. It's essentially flat. The maximum number already peaks up. The average still is kind of well behaved, but that's the kind of the catch of statistics. When we have a single trial and we are only interested in first place to find a single solution, our initial point might be the bad one. And that's only a saddle after we interrupt and say, okay, that's now stuck in the local minimum. I go now up to 95, since that's where I stopped kind of these explorations up to 100 solutions. You see kind of, a, that's all the, just the statistical variance we see. It's getting bigger and bigger. We can always be lucky kind of to hit the solutions where we early, but we also might have to wait where we long. So I was not lucky with, did I mention 5,779? May I ask about something you already kind of <laughs> mentioned? Uh, because as you said, uh, the problem is like finding the absolute minimum of some multidimensional function. So it's really similar to, let's say, machine learning problems. So did you yes. try to use some, let's say, modified gradients from machine learning, like stochastic gradients of gradients but with we memories? We haven't tried any of that, kind of just uh, by lack of manpower. Kind of both a bit lack of manpower and computational power. I would really be happy to see that explore, but uh, as I said, it just hasn't been done. Uh, by the way, uh, Marcus, concerning computational power, you wrote something about 10 or 20 years of uh, CPU. So in practice, how long it took you? To, your computer was running for how many hours, days, weeks? Um, say it's a back system. You, you submit your job, and then it gets assigned whenever there is kind of a, a free core or a free node in the cluster. So it's in that sense a bit hard to predict, but I would sometimes use kind of 200 uh, jobs in parallel. Yes, but practically to get your results, the best result you got, you had to wait like a week or month for the outcome or longer? I, I I really cannot give you practical figures, so, but, but it's more on the kind of maybe two weeks, something like that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. but clearly, it also depends kind of uh, when you have been lucky kind of uh, and hit one. Okay. okay. Excuse me, Marcus, can you go one, one slide a bit more? Pardon? Uh, I was a bit low. Uh, can you, could you go one slide before to this graph for a second? Yes, so the, you can see clearly some oscillations here. Is there a reason for, I mean, in time? You see um, the, have, is this just because you didn't? 
observation actually the those graphs are all from last november when i gave a talk at the max planck institute kind of justifying why i had used so many resources and then i observed that and uh, i exchanged with andrew who did most of this kind of numerical calculations before he had observed that as well but we didn't have an easy explanation and we didn't didn't investigate further into that. Kind of uh, in first place, kind of we are interested to get a single solution, but clearly okay. if the pattern would help us kind of uh, to go further out, it's worth investigating. So it's always a bit of a trade kind of uh, yeah, yeah, sure. where you put your personal resources on it. But, but, but it's a uh, it's a clear striking observation, kind of all, that we have this pattern of three, but then there are some kind of, all, so to say, unusual dips. I'm not sure whether 100 kind of solutions is sufficient statistics for that already. It's also the question, that's all something Andrew did, and uh, did, how good is the... Uh, the sampling of initial points. Mm -hmm. There might be a bias in that already. So there's a lot of things kind of, uh, when you really want to get rigorous results, which one should investigate in further details. But then the question is kind of, uh, what is the, the gain for the purpose of finding a solution? And in particular, it's, in the end, you might be able to add one more solution, kind of one more dimension kind of to the list, but we are really aiming at gaining sufficient insight to arrive at a formal proof and not just to add more. That's also, I have to stress kind of all, all this is not kind of just about number crunching. It's really to have sufficient data to get more insight into the problem and support for conjectures or even to derive new conjectures. Marcus, um, did, so all of that, that graph was just assuming Zauner symmetry, not, you, you, you're not using any other symmetries as input to. For that it was only Zauner symmetry imposed. Yeah, okay. And for the original one, kind of uh, here, I was the comparison between no symmetry at all and with sound symmetry. But the higher you go, kind of uh, effectively, you need to impose symmetries. Okay. Symmetries is the kind of key point for our paper from 2017. So Envo was continuing his kind of numerical investigation and he came up with a solution in dimension 124, which has a prescribed symmetry of order six. And it turned out kind of carrying out the symmetry analysis, which could be a talk on its own, that we had a symmetry of order 30. And then kind of uh, after discussions between Enmu and me back and forth, we actually identified that particular symmetry and also the dimension as a series of dimensions which starts at 4, 8, 1948. Up to that, we did have even exact solutions. 124 was the new one. And it goes on and you see particularly this dimension 5779. I tried with no success to find a solution popping up in the sequence. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this number with uh, 5,000 uh, and uh, so on. So this is not divided by three. And by this insight it's from... Hmm? It's a prime number. Yes. So by this insight from the previous graph, when uh, this division by three seems to play a crucial role in... Uh, terms of uh, how fast it converges, maybe it would be better to choose another number, which is divided by three. Uh, you are right, but that was Gene's question. If we restricted ourselves to this Zauner symmetry, but it turns out that in this series, the order of the symmetry, the kth element in the sequence has six times k additional symmetry. 
So when we go up, we have 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, 48. So we have a symmetry of order 54 for this dimension. So that is what helps a lot. So these additional symmetries, which is kind of of high order, cuts down the dimension of the search space a lot. And that allows us to find new exact solutions for dimension 124 and 323. And we even were able to go up with numerical solutions up to dimension 2208. The latter one being divisible by three, kind of all to Gregor's observations, but our, uh, so the 5779 is the first one in the series, and that's why I was trying to find that one as an initial solution. So actually we can write down, I go very quickly over that, the symmetry kind of is just given this two by two matrix has this matrix and that is the matrix that is related to Fibonacci numbers. And there's also something called Lucas numbers and that is what the dimension is related to. And there's a lot of other properties and I have to refer to the paper. One can actually generalize this Fibonacci and Lucas numbers. We arrive at symmetries where the matrix the one kind of down here is replaced by M. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going very quickly over that and just show you a diagram. It shows you in the top row, we have the sequence of dimensions 4, 8, 19, 48, 124, and so forth. That's the one we had for our Fibonacci Luca sequence. And now if we increase our number M, we get other sequences and the green numbers actually show you those are dimensions where by now we have exact solutions and the blue ones tells you we have at least numerical solutions. The space down here is blank just for the reason that the numbers get very big too quickly. So it doesn't mean that we cannot calculate the numbers but you see kind of uh, the numbers grow here very fast and they start to grow even faster. That's why we only have these few numbers listed here. But the good thing is now, while already in our initial paper from 2010 with Andrew Scott, we identified for example, this sequence where we had dimension, uh, symmetry of order six, now we have a growing order of the symmetry, that is, we get more and help, more help by the symmetry. Those symmetries, if you take a closer look at the matrix, it turns out it has determined minus one. For unitary symmetries, we require determinant plus one. We again can derive some symmetries where the matrix two by two has this particular form. One can do similar calculation is actually something that is yet to be published. And we arrive at a similar picture here now. The difference is that the order of the symmetry in the sequence of dimensions only grows by a factor of three instead of six. But now you find, again, a lot of dimensions labeled in green. That means we have exact solutions for them. Some of them are actually labeled in blue. And one thing particular for those more familiar with the topic, we had the dimensions up here. That's the very same we had seen before, 4, 8, 19, 48, 124. And I put them in italics for the very reason that we have not found a solution which had only the unitary symmetry prescribing the unitary symmetry always implied to have anti-unitary symmetry as well. I don't know why that happens or whether that's a general, that we have just not found them, but clearly in first place, we are interested in finding just a single solution. So I 
just mention that there is a connection between symmetries and the conjecture that was in particular put forward in the paper by Marcus Appleby, Tian Chen, Steve Lamia, and uh, Shane Waldron. And that puts a connection between the exact solutions in which type of number field they live in. We were able to connect that to what is the potential size of the symmetry. And I said, in interest of time, with the questions in between, I just show you the result. Now, kind of, we have another plot where we have logarithmic scale for the dimension and linear scale for the additional symmetry. And you find that this sequence, 4, 8, 19, 48, and the fourth, where the symmetry grows with 6k times the dimension, that is the sequence of dimension where we have the largest possible symmetry according to the conjectures. There are other sequences showing up, but for all of them, kind of the growth rate is slower, so we get less help by the symmetry. You also see that asymptotically, we get a linear scale, which means that the symmetry grows just with the log of the dimension. So we cannot get too much help of the symmetry, but the most help by the symmetry we can get is actually this sequence of dimensions related to the Fibonacci numbers. Just kind of a, to see that we can go even further. I did the calculation up to dimension one, 100,000. Quite often the symmetry stays only at three, but then for certain sequence of dimensions, we can get more help by the symmetry. Also, let's look at where we are with our known solutions. And so I'm just going again with logarithmic scale. The known solutions went up to 2208. That was the largest for which we had a numerical solution with some other sporadic ones. But it turns out that here, what I plot is the dimension divided by 50, 60, and 17 as the size of the symmetry. If you just rephrase that is, when the dimension divided by the symmetry is 70, we are getting up to this yellow curve. So when we get sufficient help such that the effective dimension of our search space is 70, we have a chance to find a numerical solution, but something between 50 and 70, that's where most of the known solutions like lie. So whenever we go beyond that, it seems that we are hitting the wall of the numerics. Maybe new techniques will help us to break that barrier, but we seem to hit effectively this barrier that we cannot go through. Also, when you look at this 199, that effectively where we are with the general situation where we can only have a help of the symmetry of order three. So in my remaining five, six minutes, I will just briefly mention how we get to numerical solutions. Initially, we were just trying to solve the system of equations with some success. Also imposing some symmetry, reduced the number of variables, and that helped us to find solutions. But there is a technique, details you can find in this paper. Effectively, the techniques tells you, which I summarize more formally here is, you are calculating what is the overlap of the fiducial projection you have with these elements of the Weil Heisenberg group, which are here phrased as displacement operators. And it turns out that these coefficients, they can be related to number theory. 
And without having kind of the effective number field, you can form just by numerics a polynomial. <coughs> and it turned out that the polynomial has coefficients which lie in the number field of small degree. So when you have calculated this minimal polynomial with respect to your kind of high precision numerical solutions, then you can apply techniques that minimal polynomial of these coefficients. The point is when you have this exact minimal polynomial, then you can even solve for its root and that will be the expansion coefficients. The importation catch or only catch of this method is you don't know a priori what is the positions you need. Although you need to start with a numerical solution in first place, and then at the end, you have to solve for the roots of this polynomial. And since you're working with these expansion coefficients, you're working in the space of matrices, you have to solve for these squared coefficients. So what I observed is, in particular situations, instead of calculating the overlap with the fiducial projection, we can actually work with the coefficients of the state of our polynomial. So instead of deriving D squared kind of uh, elements, we are now working only with D elements and effectively can, we can apply similar techniques and that allowed me to calculate exact solutions for these 57 additional dimensions, ranging from as low as 26 up to the largest one, 1299. That was kind of what uh, kept me and the computers of the Max Planck Society busy for the last two years. But that also allowed to find new conjectures what actually the field that supports these particular solutions like. I hope with a lot of delays to finally put out this paper, say I put at least this year, September, but I hope it will happen earlier than that. There's another technique which I want to briefly mention. That is something Marcus Appleby and Ingmar Bengtsson have can successfully apply this. And that was also now working with a numerical fiducial vector, but instead of expanding it with respect to the displacement operators, or as I did, kind of to look at these particular fiducial vectors with respect to the standard basis, where the Weil-Heisenberg group is defined, they were actually looking at how can we express this vector with respect to the eigenbasis, the eigenspace of our symmetry. And since, of course, the symmetry space in the kind of a smallest or kind of in the le least favorable case, it's one third of the total dimension. How can we pick a particular good basis? They were able to do so. And it turned out that for certain dimensions, when you look at these expansion coefficients, their absolute values, they separated the absolute values from the phases or looked at ratios of phases. And they had particular nice, that means low degree, moderate size coefficients, minimal polynomials. So they applied that to dimensions 5, 15, and 195, which is a particular series, which is related to a number capital D being equal to three. The next one in that particular series would be dimension 195 times 193. That one is still open, 
But what I have been able recently to do is I found an exact solution using these techniques, and I mentioned 725, which is actually in some sense number theoretically related, also has capital D equal to three. The problem is the final result lies in the number field of degree 134,400, which means that each exact element here has that many rational coefficients. So writing down the solution and even doing calculation of that solution is horrible. I think the file I have currently storing that one has more than one gigabyte. So it's an exact solution, but nothing you really want to do calculations with. Difficulties with this method is that kind of in terms of number theory, we need additional square roots for intermediate results. So I was kind of calculating with a field intermediately, which has a degree that was even four times bigger. And it's also not clear for which dimensions this approach will work. It's also something that is awaiting further investigation. But as I mentioned, more people kind of initially, I want to share really very late, hot off the fire, some results, still recipes under development together with Marcus Appleby, Ingemar Bengtsson, Michael House, and Gary McConnell. So effectively taking a closer look at all these new exact solutions, there have been new conjectures relating PPUMs and number theory, and actually conjectures in number theory. And the most kind of surprising thing is we no longer require to have a numerical fiducial vector. And we even can avoid factoring exact polynomials over number fields of large degree. Of course, there is no free lunch. So far, we need very high precision for intermediate steps. But the good thing is, just about six weeks ago, we actually came up with a solution, which is effectively even exact one for dimension 5,579, and also dimension 787 and 487. It turned out that the smaller dimensions were actually more complicated than the big one. So it was not just shooting for the big dimension, but the lot kind of the, the big symmetries for this large dimension that helped a lot. Also, another catch is that most of the small examples where this technique applies, we already have an exact solution. So we're really facing the problem kind of to further refine and test our recipes we are facing kind of highly complex challenging, but we are very excited, or particular I am very excited that we finally found the solution and that we have new techniques that allows us to find more solutions. So with that, I want to conclude, kind of again giving an overview of what was kind of the timeline of course, it's not a very accurate one, but when we go back to 2003, the paper by Joe Wellers, I already mentioned, including Andrew Scott, they had solutions up to 45. The paper which appeared on archive already in 2009 with Andrew Scott, Andrew had pushed the numerics to 67. I added a couple of numeric, uh, of exact solutions. Then Andrew Scott, pushed it further to dimension 121, put out a paper beginning of 2017. He already had included some of these additional solutions, in particular 124. Then Chris Fuchs group, using code by Andrew Scott, pushed it up to 151, essentially kind of around the same time. That is now pushed to 193 and a couple of additional solutions. 
But more importantly for me, those solutions, they allowed us to gain more insight into the problem, which also now in terms of exact algebraic solutions, early 2017, we had 32 dimensions, the biggest one being 124. That by now is pushed up all dimensions to 53. And we have this huge list of dimensions, which are 115 by now. And I've put in green ones, the most recent ones we have added. With that, I want to thank all of you. And again, mention the support we get through this small growth program and also the additional support through the Max Planck Society, which allowed me to compute all the solutions. Thanks, and I'm happy to take further questions. Thank you very much for a really great talk. Congratulations to uh, nice results. Could you show us the last slide with all those numbers again? Thank you very much. Yes. So now a technical question. Will you allow us to take the slides and put it on our web page? Or it's too early? Uh, kind of a... Uh... Unless my co-authors, uh, at least two of them are present, uh, I don't because see any, have, any raving. Uh, us to have this list somehow. Maybe we can just use it somewhere or some of us uh, quoting your results. And so this... No, the idea is kind of, uh, the, you can get the whole set of slides. And so don't okay. put it out of context, but uh, just put the slides from the talk on the web page. Okay. I'm happy with it. Thank you. Um, and then the last number, 5799, is in slanted font. This is, uh, it means uh, that it was updated it, it, recently. It, it, it's just uh, the those are three dimensions which were obtained kind of in the last six weeks. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, congratulations. So let's start the discussion. Who would like to ask first? Maybe the guests from far away. So Chris, do you have any further questions? I think you are the geographically furthest away. Well, uh, uh, some other parts of my group is here, Blake Stacy and uh, John DeBroda. So we're all, all equally far away. I, I think I asked, the, the question that I ask you, I'll just give you just a touch of context. Um, I had always looked at the frame potential before. And um, when we quantified, so, so in, a, in a paper with John and Blake, we quantified a certain measure of, of, of um, deviation of the Born rule from the law of total probability. And there an interesting function arose that is something like the identity. So the, the norm of the identity minus the inverse of the Gram matrix for the POVM. And we found that that was minimized um, by a, a sick POVM. Okay, so the frame potential is minimized. I, my first guess is that the inverse might not well behave for minimization, but yeah, I would be happy to be proven wrong. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm just telling you the origin of my question. And the origin <laughs> of the question is that the sick POVM minimizes both the frame potential and this more complicated function. And I essentially assumed that both of them were of equal complexity because of that. But recently we've been looking at real Hilbert space versions and there's quite a divergence in behavior of the two different functions. So I, that caused me to wonder whether there was a divergence of the behavior even in the complex case and that maybe there's something better to look at than the, than the frame potential. But but I'm, you know, oh. an inverse is, is a very ugly thing to use. So another thing kind of uh, I'd like to mention, which 
So you put out this 3D conjecture and that effectively means that we restrict one of these sums just to the first three values. And it turns out that if you are already close to a solution, then this is very good. So this is something for some time I used to refine solutions, kind of to reiterate since then the complexity kind of is reduced by a factor of the dimension. But when you restrict yourself to the first three, say for J, K still runs from one to D, then the function has a lot of local minima and uh, there is little chance to find anything. Mm. So kind of if you are already close to a solution, then kind of a truncating the frame potential in that way is a good idea. The other thing kind of, uh, since I had mentioned that very briefly, when we look at the indices here, kind of, uh, it, it's just a very hand-waving hand argument. How do you get local minima? It's by kind of a high degree, high kind of non-linearity. So what I did, I was avoiding repeated indices here, kind of to avoid local minima. This is, of course, partially spoiled when you put check onto the spaces, you again make indices equal. But that was the modification I was telling about, kind of just dropping repeated indices from this here there is no kind of rigorous argument why this function would be good, but that experimentally, heuristically, it turned out to be good in many cases. But it's not a rigorous change of the function. And is it clearly to have a different function, which by the end of the day even might provide us more insight in the structure of its global minima, would be great. Mm. But is it for the mere sake of pushing kind of the smallest dimension for we don't know yet the solution from 193 to 200, there's not, to me, no longer good justification kind of uh, in doing that. Is it at the same time, I would be happy if someone in the audience or the student of someone of you would be curious enough to investigate. Uh, I, I'm very happy kind of to share my experience. So uh, I have developed on that. Well, we'll see. So thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the audience? So I just realized that also 